And hello once again to one of these lecture video things that I do. Um, my name is LC Lupus, or at least that is the name that I go by on the internet and in my writing. So, hello. Uh, today we're going to be looking at semiotic models in general. So, each of these semiotic models that I'm going to be talking about um, is, has already been covered in... Um, has already been covered in some depth um, in a video each of their own. So there will be a, um, a list of the different videos below that will give you, you know, um, the, the direct links to those videos. Because if you decide to use any of these kind of semiotic models, it is best to understand the specific, uh, the, the more specific details of each semiotic model. However, the point of this particular video is to talk about which semiotic model you should use if you are doing uh, an analysis of some kind because it really does depend on what you have decided that you want to analyze. So, we're going to be looking at uh, a couple of them. Ferdinand de Saussure and his dyadic model, uh, Charles Sanders Peirce and his triadic model, Umberto Eco with his functive model, Roman Jakobsen and his six, uh, six literary functions model, and then Roland Barthes, the cultural myth model. So, each of these is a sort of a different way of looking at things, um, and they're all they're all useful in their own ways, depending on what it is exactly that you want to analyze. So if you're having to analyze something for an essay or something like that, you want to choose which provided you've been given a choice of how to analyze it. But these can really help to, as a model, uh, as a methodology under which you can analyze things. So we're going to start with the basic one, Ferdinand de Saussure, even though Charles Sanders Peirce was actually first. So Ferdinand de Saussure, whose work has influenced a lot of other people in literary theory, is um, sort of the main person we tend to think of when we think of semiotics. Now, he has what's called a dyadic model, in which the sign, the sign is, you know, uh, made up of, of different things, depending on, but the sign is a, a meaning of some kind. So uh, it's something that has a meaning. So in his particular case, the sign is made up of the signifier and the signified. So it's a dyadic, meaning it's you know two different things that it's made up of. The signifier, which is the thing itself, so say a word, an image, or something. And the signified is the meaning behind it. All right, cool. So that is what that is in very, very basic terms. Now, his system is useful if you're looking at something that's very linguistic, so if you're looking at something that is, you know, literature, for instance, a book, short story, poem, whatever, you can use that to better understand words and the meanings associated with them and how those meanings can, you know, uh, alter. It's very linguistic. Technically, de Saussure was a ling uh, linguist, and so his work is based on linguistics in general. So if you're looking at something that is purely linguistic, that is a good thing to look at. Uh, but of course, if you are looking at something linguistic, I would recommend going and watching the actual video that goes into it in much more depth because you're going to want to know uh, how to use it, when to use it, etc. Now, when it comes to Charles Sanders Peirce, so, which is pronounced or it's written Pierce, but I've heard it's pronounced Peirce and it's actually kind of difficult to find something that does said for certain. So it's a little bit irritating, but it's fine. It's fine. So Peirce has the so-called triadic model. Now, the, you get the iconic sign, the indexical sign, and the symbolic sign. So the iconic sign is something where there is a uh, resemblance of some, of some kind. So imagine a drawing of something. So a drawing of fire probably represents um, fire. Uh, quite obvious. Indexical, whereas is something that there is a causal relationship between the two things. So when it comes to, say, fire, if you see a, a drawing of smoke, it probably represents fire, right? So there, there is a causal relationship between smoke and fire. Fire causes smoke, so therefore, blah, blah, blah. Whereas symbolic is, symbolic is actually basically de Saussure's version. It is, it is whether it's an arbitrary relationship. So especially look at symbols are, are symbolic, as you might imagine from the word. Um, so take something like the word fire, right, is... It's an arbitrary. It's entirely arbitrary. Its relationship to fire is determined by, you know, the language that you speak. It could also be pretty much anything. Any word is symbolic, but also certain uh, things that we take as symbols. So, say religious symbols, right? The the cross, 
represents Christianity because of what is associated with it. But if, if you had never heard of Christianity and you saw a cross, you would think nothing of it. You would just think it's geometry. So that's why it is symbolic. Now, this model is very, very useful if you want to analyze anything that is in some way pictorial. So a film, uh, a comic, uh, anything like that, where it, it can incorporate... Um, because also, for instance... Uh, De Saussure claimed that like all words are you know symbolic. They're they're all like that. But that's not that's not actually accurate. Because what about things that are onomatopoeic? So imagine something like the word boom. That sounds like what it is. Also, you know, meow, woof. These sound like what they are, which is you know means that they're not entirely arbitrary. They are actually connected to it. There is an indexical relationship there, um, which is quite interesting. But Peirce's model is very useful if you do want to look at something that is like a movie or something like that, because it takes into account things that are not entirely arbitrary, which makes it quite interesting. The next model is Umberto Eco. Now there you can actually use it for both. You can use it for linguistic or non-linguistic things because essentially the idea is that the signifier is replaced with the idea of the expression and the signified replaced with the idea of the, the content and it becomes a sign function instead of just a sign. So it is made up of these so-called functives of expression and content which then make up the sign function as a whole. Now, these the reason for this is because it's highly variable. It is more variable and more adapted to literature in particular than de Saussure's model, uh, which is sort of like a very basic model. So you can use it for something pictorial. It is better used, I would say, in many ways for literature specifically. If you want to analyze literature, Umberto Eco's model is good. However, and here's the thing. If you want to use Umberto Eco's method, uh, you kind of also have to bring up Peirce. Uh, you have to, sorry, you have to bring up Saussure because Eco's model is based on Saussure's model. So, you know, Econian, I don't know how you would say that, is based on Saussurean semiotics. So you need to understand the one to, to, to understand the other, um, which is, you know, makes it a little, I mean, a little bit irritating in that sense. So if you use Umberto Eco, you have to also use the Saussure, but they can be useful for literature. Uh, but that particular one can be very useful for literature. So that is where I would recommend uh, using it. Um, if you're going to look at specific literature, because it's much more variable and it allows for signifiers to have multiple signifiers based on context. But once again, you should watch the or listen to whatever the, the, the video that is done about Umberto Eco's um, semiotic model in more depth, because that will be useful if you do decide to use it. Now, you could also, of course, use uh, now, if you wanted to to look at something in a in a bit more context, really, and and look at it in in more, uh, you know, sort of um, more depth, you could use Roman Jakobson's um, structural model, which is also a semiotic model. So this is is it's a it's based on the communication model. So the communication model, you know, is that there's sender, message, receiver. However, this model is very useful. Uh, because this is a, an exaggeration of that, it turns the three mod the the three, uh, the three based communication model. You know, sender like the artist, the message, the the poet that I mean the the poem, the book, whatever, and the receiver, the person who reads it. It then turns it into a six part model, which I will explain in some in a little bit of detail. But I would recommend watching the video to fully explore it. Um, this is useful if you want to explore more than just the text. You know. Like, if you're going to look at literature, but you don't want to just look at the book, you want to look at everything about the book. Like you want to look at the creation of the book, the reception of the book. If you want to do that, if you want to understand the context around a book, this is a very useful model. You might hear a plane going overhead. That is not related to Jakobsen's model, but there is a, a um, airport not that long from here, not that far from here, and so you might hear it in the background, but hopefully not. If not, I've just wasted a lot of time on talking about this. So anyway, let's get back to the uh, communication model. Um, basically, it still has the sender message receiver thing, but it also incorporates the idea of the context. So that is what is around the message, the receiver, the sender. Um, it is the, the, the world that is around it. What led to its creation? What 
uh, led to it being received the way it did, etc., etc. It also looks at the channel, so that is the means through which that is conveyed, the message is conveyed. So imagine um, uh, what is different between a novel and a comic. What is different between a uh, uh, a comic and a movie? What is different between a movie? And a song, you know, the channel, the way in which it is done changes. And then it also incorporates codes, which is sort of understanding how it, um, how it uses language and that kind of stuff. So Jakobsen's model is very useful for if you want to look at something in more depth and everything around it, not just the text itself, but what is around it. But once again, I would recommend that you check out the, the full um, the video, which will be in the description. Lastly, um, the myth model, the cultural myth model. Now, this is uh, Roland Barthes. This is specifically if you want to analyze and interrogate cultural signs, if you want to understand things, uh, sort of cultural myths. Uh, so if you're looking at something much broader, so if you want to be able to understand something like how is patriarchy presented in the world? How is masculinity presented in the world? How is femininity presented in the world? How is capitalism presented in the world? Etc. 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 These things which are cultural myths. A cultural myth is something that is not uh, natural. It's not real. It is something that is created by humans as a kind of social construct, but we treat it as if it is real. So, you know, think of masculinity. A lot of people are like, oh no, masculinity is definitely real. But masculinity is actually something that is created by humans over a very, very long period of time. And there's lots of people contributing to the creation of masculinity and to the point where we now think that it is real. <laughs> so we, we think it is real It has because it has been naturalized, is the term. But once again, I would recommend looking at the video that goes into it in much more depth. But that model is very useful for if you want to look at something that's broader in society by incorporating literary texts. So that will that's... Like, you don't want to actually analyze a book. You want to analyze what the book is presenting to us. So those are the kind of models that, uh, the, the, you know, the, the reasons that you might choose these models. And there are videos for each of them that go into them. Now, just to sort of say, these models can be mixed and matched. You don't have to use one. You can mix them together. And also, for instance, the, the, the cultural myth model requires you to understand Sasurian semiotics as well, just like with Umberto Eco's one. Uh, they require you to understand the other ones. So you can mix them together and work with them together. Like you could use Roman Jakobson's communication model while also incorporating like Charles Sanders Pierce's, Charles Sanders Pierce's, uh, Pierce's um, model. You can mix them together. And there are also many other varieties that I didn't even talk about. Things like social semiotics, biosemiotics, ecosemiotics. These are further things that could be explored. I'm not really going to go into them, but just sort of to say social semiotics is using semiotic models to understand how uh, human beings act within societies. Whereas biosemiotics is actually looking at things like how biological functions operate alongside one another, you know, uh, to create meaning within themselves. And ecosemiotics is kind of similar. It's looking at environmental things, how it interacts with humans and non-humans um, to create its own kind of meaning. So those are other ways to also look at it. Those are other models that could incorporate things like Sasurian semiotics. Um, but yeah, now, just to, as a final point, semiotics must always be remembered as something that is correlational and often arbitrary rather than something causal. It is not factual. It is generally based on how a, a society perceives things to be, which does not mean that it is, you know, accurate. <laughs> so that is important to keep in mind as well as just a, a thing. But uh, yeah, that's that's pretty much it for this video. Uh, it's quite a short one, ultimately, uh, just going over some of these, why you might want to use something in a certain context over others. So yeah, that is that is it. We're done. Um, so uh, if you have enjoyed this, uh, you can always support me by doing things like the, uh, you can check out my books. My books are, um, they're obviously very semiotic. These are, they're novels, so they're, they're not uh, academic, but they do explore certain concepts. So the latest one is called Flesh, Stone, Blues, and that explores certain ideas with relation to um, human consciousness and how we would live if uh, we could be entirely disconnected from our bodies. So it's a world in which human beings have um, 
have chips that they can transfer their bodies. They can like have multiple bodies. Um, and it's sort of a dystopia in which uh, this, this kind of world exists. So uh, if you like cyberpunk stories, you know, if you like things like um, Blade Runner, um, Shadow Run, things like that, then it'll be for you. Other than that, uh, you can also like and subscribe to the channel. Those are always lovely. Uh, things to do. Also, of course, if you have any questions, you can pop them into the comments, which is always uh, nice because it's, if you have any questions, I can always answer them. And if you have literary concepts that you would like explored and explained, I might be able to do a video about them if I know the topic. So yeah, you can pop any of that stuff down in the comments. Uh, also, you can share the video to other people who might uh, benefit from it. Other than that, I uh, hope you have a great day, weekend, month ahead, and uh, goodbye.